Hey everybody, I'm Stephanie Vichinsky coming to you from Method Canine and I wanted to talk to you today about advocacy. We hear about dogs that are explosive out in public, they're barking, they're lunging, they're growling, they're completely out of control when they see another dog or they, need, they see a person and there's a really specific reason for that and knowing the reasoning is really important and knowing what to do about it is also important. So the reason that dogs develop some of those behaviors is a lot of different reasons but one that we're going to focus on today is when dogs don't feel that we're going to handle the situation. So uh, very often dogs don't start out reactive. They start out giving much smaller signs of discomfort. So you have a dog that isn't super friendly with people, that isn't super comfortable with other dogs, um, in fact may have had bad experiences and really would prefer to be away from those types of stressors. So we have dogs in the beginning that give us really small signs to tell us that they are uncomfortable with those particular stimuli. So you ha might have a dog that when a person approaches, they kind of suction cup to your leg or they hide between your legs or something like that you have a new puppy doing this type of thing that's the first sign that the dog is talking to you and telling you that they are uncomfortable with that situation and a lot of times we kind of misread the situation and we think the dog needs to just break out of their shell so we bring the dog closer and the dog says I'm really trying to talk to you and tell you that I need a little bit more space and you're bringing me closer to this stressor you're having this person come in and pet me between your legs you're pulling me out from between your legs um, you're giving them food and trying to coax me out it's a good boy um, and it's lending to more stress rather than decreasing it so that's one way of dogs communicate with us in the beginning but another way that a dog can communicate with us in a very small way is when a stressor presents itself they might start sniffing the ground and it might seem odd because there's nothing there really to sniff especially if you're in the middle of a street or in an area like this especially if the dog's already been there before there's not a whole lot to sniff but the dog's nose consistently goes down anytime that stressor kind of gets near them that's another way of a dog going into avoidance to tell you hey I'm kind of uncomfortable with this situation so they're kind of putting their nose down uh, I'm you know I'm trying to make sure that you understand I'm not really into this I'm not making eye contact with you I'm not going up to you I'm kind of staying very almost standoffish with you so so that's another sign that we typically tend to miss. And then of course there's the leash pulling and the trying to move away and the, the flight and all of that sort of stuff. When we miss these signs consistently, our dogs say, well clearly the human can't hear me or the handler can't hear me, so I have to make my sign a little bit bigger. So the next step that dogs typically take with reactivity or fear, anxiety or what have you, is they will maybe bark or they'll low growl or something like that to make their voice heard a little bit better. And so a lot of times we'll walk past them like, oh, well, he's never growled at a child before that's that's really strange or he's never growled at another dog normally he likes other dogs right and so maybe we go purposely go to the store a little bit more we take them to somewhere to socialize the dog and it actually winds up intensifying that dog's reaction because he's saying hey I would like a little bit more space and now you're pushing me even further into the fire and so really the end result is that reactivity that we all know, the dogs barking, the dogs lunging, the dogs going crazy. And again, one root cause of that is the fear or anxiety aspect. There are other root causes that we're not gonna get into into this video. But if you have that dog that is a little bit fearful, nervous, anxious around new people and other dogs, and you are dealing with reactivity, a big part of it might be that they're communicating and you're not advocating enough. So let's talk about advocacy in dog training. Not everybody understands exactly what that term means but I want to kind of elaborate on it and show you exactly what you can do to help your dog feel more comfortable in the presence of new people or other dogs advocacy essentially means that you're sticking up for your dog you're creating space for your dog and you're doing a lot of the heavy lifting to make sure that the environment does not encroach on the space that your dog is requesting so for instance if I'm here with Tom, I'm getting ready to go into a really crowded department store with Tom and in the beginning Tom was highly reactive to news people. He has human aggression, he has dog aggression, he barks, he lunges, he crocodile rolls when he sees other people because he wants space. He doesn't want those things in his little bubble and he wants me to advocate for him. So let's talk about some steps that you can do to help your dog feel more relaxed when in the presence of stressors and teach them how to develop trust in you.
okay? So the only way that we can develop trust in the dog is to prove to them that we can handle situations. And how we handle situations really dictates the response that we get from the dog. So a lot of times I see owners advocating for their dogs or attempting to advocate through their, for their dogs through verbal language. And it's great to communicate with another human, but it's not great to communicate with a dog. Let me tell you what I mean. You have a dog like Tom who really doesn't want to be pet, doesn't want to be approached, doesn't want to be talked to, doesn't want a dog in his face, and someone approaches you with Tom and says, hey, can I pet your dog? right? Most people will stand there and say, oh, nope, sorry, he's in training, or no, he's kind of stressed right now, or he's nervous, please don't pet the dog, or what have you. And very often people will take that, that warning and move away. The problem with that is, is that you may have convinced that person to go away, but you didn't earn any brownie points with the dogs, because dogs are not verbal animals. So most of what we say goes in one ear and out the other. They don't really compute all of it. So if we're not actively showing the dog that we are advocating, we often don't earn the trust that we think we are. So a better way to advocate is, yes, use our words to communicate to the human being or to the dog to move out of your dog's space, but we also need to advocate with our body and this is often the missing link with dog owners is they don't know how to use their body correctly so if I had somebody that came in and asked to pet Tom because I know he doesn't want to be pet I'm gonna use my body to advocate rather than just using my words so what I'm gonna do as soon as someone starts getting in his space and I consider his space to be about six feet if I feel someone's getting kind of closer than that especially if they're making eye contact with Tom or I feel that they are gonna get even closer into his space I'm gonna use my body to prevent that so the first thing that I'm gonna do is I'm already going to change my body language so that that person understands that I'm stepping between my dog and them okay and one aspect that's really important is I always have my front part of my body facing the dog because this is typically how I deal with the dog on a regular basis when I'm training with them or what have you they're used to taking direction from this part of my body if I face my back toward the dog that can be highly stressful and they can feel more alone if we have our back facing the dog and our front facing the person because my dog's not used to taking direction from the back side of me so when I deal with people approaching my dog, I'll very often put my body like this so that the dog can make eye contact with me. I could use my leash, I can give hand gestures if I need to, and the dog's used to taking direction this way. This is also a little bit standoffish towards someone approaching, which gives the hint, please don't approach my dog without having to be rude about it. So if I'm standing like this, I can still turn and communicate with the person. I can say, oh, you know what? He's a little bit nervous, actually. He's not a big fan of people. He's not a big fan of other dogs, right? And and I can communicate not only with the dog, but I can communicate with the human as well. So we're gonna to have to use body language and verbal language. When that stressor, that person or other dog goes away, I get all the brownie points for that because I was the person who stepped in, made the dog feel safe, and pushed that stressor out of the way by using my body. Now you might have to amplify your body language if that dog or that person is more persistent. They don't always go away the first time you tell them to. So sometimes this is enough, but you have people that don't pick up on these types of signals and don't listen to your words very well. You also have your hands to help advocate for the dog. So if someone's reaching in to pet your dog, oh, nope, sorry, he's pretty nervous. Thank you, please don't pet, right? You can make your message even more clear while still keeping your dog relaxed. We do this with all of our board and train dogs. Anytime our dogs are out in public, because we're usually dealing with behavioral issues, we don't let anybody pet our dogs. We don't let anybody get into their space. And even if the person's just coming to talk to me, they're not even making eye contact with the dog. I get a lot of people who approach me, ask me if I'm a dog trainer, or say that they've seen me on the internet, they've seen me on Facebook and Instagram, they've seen our videos or what have you. Even if they're approaching me to talk to me and it has nothing to do with the dog, I'm still gonna change my position and move in front of the dog and communicate with them like this so that they understand that I'm talking to the, I'm communicating with the dog and the dog understands that I'm advocating. This really helps the dog slow way down and trust that you're going to handle situations. So we can take dogs that used to explode on everything and we can take them into the middle of the fire in the most intense situations and they firmly believe that I'm going to advocate. So advocating with your body is critical for communication with the dog. Now, that's when your dog is stationary. You can kind of advocate in all different angles if you need to. You can even move behind your dog and advocate, right? But when you're in motion, you have to think on your feet a little bit more. You don't have 
quite as much dexterity when moving with the dog. So something to think about is when you've picked the side that you prefer to walk your dog on, we train all of our dogs on the left, that means all of our handlers are on the right, we try to train our trainers and train our clients to walk the dog in such a way that you're often putting yourself between the dog and the stressor. So that means if someone's coming down the aisle here, rather than always going to the right, which is typically what we do because we drive on the right, I'm gonna to try to gravitate towards the left so that I can put myself between the dog and the stressor and the dog can feel advocated while we're in motion. Now, that's not always possible and you might have to do some fancy footwork to help advocate for the dog, but the ultimate goal is to try to advocate as often as possible. Now, his big triggers are dogs and humans, but your dog might have a totally different trigger. Your dog might be terrified of cars, right? And you might have to think on your feet, how do I put my body between the dog and myself to teach the dog that I will handle the car, right? I will take care of the situation. Maybe your dog is scared of skateboards or bicycles or what have you. Teaching the dog through advocacy that you're going to handle the situation, okay? Now, adv advocacy is 50% of the problem. Right, And that's all this video is going to focus on, but it should help you get some really nice results in a short period of time if you know how to start communicating with your dog. And the only way that you can truly convince the dog that you can handle situations is to start taking them out into situations. So you can't always practice this in your home or in your driveway or in your backyard. Sometimes you have to go to the local park. Sometimes you have to walk down to the end of the street. Sometimes you have to come where I am now outside of a big department store and work with your dog. Maybe your dog isn't ready to go all the way into the store, but maybe you can work in the parking lot. Maybe you could work with a handful of people out front and start showing the dog that you are capable of these things. It hasn't believed it in the past, but you need to prove to them that you can handle situations. Anyway, folks, I hope this really helped. Start using your body language. Advocate for your dogs. Please don't think that they're just going to get better. Please don't think that they should just be able to handle it. Please don't just throw them into the middle of the fire and say, deal with it because your dog's gonna get worse every single time. Advocate for your dog, communicate, listen to what they're saying. As soon as they feel heard, you're gonna notice huge behavioral changes. Good luck, please subscribe to our channel for more how-to videos.